My name is Mats Abdelkarim Sederberg, and uh, I am from uh, Sweden, a little town called Mora, and it's um, about four hours drive north uh, of Stockholm. So it's very traditional, there's a lot of folk music there, and people have folk costumes that they take out for occasions, like uh, graduation or uh weddings and what, what have you and there, there there's a uh, like wool jacket that men have you know it looks kind of like turkish you know with a sort of chinese color you know like the imam and uh and then a funny thing is the the leather apron there's leather apron so they were craftsmen and they were so proud of it that they even wore it to church and and it's sort of decorated as well you know there is a tradition called slöjd, which is sort of self-sufficient craft. But rather, like in the big cities, you, you would have the guilds. Like if you were working with like making chairs, for example, it would only be chairs. Like you wouldn't do anything else. This sort of like niche. In, in the guilds. Yeah, but yeah. if you're out in a village, <clears throat> you have to cut the tree down yourself. You have to know which which tree to to cut down. Like like yeah, this one is full of tar. You know, it's been injured here. So this my son will take down in ten years when we get married. And <laughs> sort of like they would know all of these things. And then you know, building the log log houses and I guess a lot of uh, tradition and uh, knowledge. Like you'd have to know these things. Like these costumes would be different in different villages. So if you would go to another village, like five kilometers away, they would have a a, a blue uh, uh, waistcoat instead of a green one. And a bit further away, they would have a dark, uh, like an indigo colored uh, jacket instead of, instead of a white one. You know, wh when I was little, it was very natural to have a, a knife and even Craftspeople all over the world, they use the Mura knife. Well, you know, it's from this um, uh, this particular town. Mura. It's, it's very reasonable a price. So it's like 20 quid or something. But, but it's like one of the best steels. Uh, and I mean, I would use either that or like Japanese. Uh, although he's a, a biologist by profession. My father... He's also a claimed uh, a fiddler, like a Swedish folk music. He fell down from a cliff, uh, you know, when he was uh, catching some rare flower, you know. So, and then he he broke his back, and he had nothing to do while while it healed. So, uh, so he started playing the violin, and he became a traditional fiddler. You know all of these songs, uh, and and also like amazing spoon carver and. And my mother also is like always doodling, you know, is a lot of calligraphy. And in the sort of townhouse there, there would be evenings where everybody would carve spoons and things. And I'd be, I don't know, seven, eight, ten, you know, do things like that, you know, together. And and my father was also a teacher in the it's something called folk. Högskola, folk high school. So it's not anything about grades, but rather a curiosity, like I want to learn this. So people go there for traditional knowledge. I mean, it's both sort of, um, you, you can both get maths and uh, physics and chemistry and like things like that, but also sort of how to dye your clothes with birch root, these kind of things or ceramics. So I've studied lots of things. I studied uh, Arabic in Damascus when things are, were a bit uh, more settled there. And uh, I uh, studied music, also like Swedish music and percussion in Istanbul. And I also studied um, uh, traditional wood techniques, you know, carving and using green wood that shrinks, you know, that fits together in different ways. Uh, not too far from where I grew up and I also did a two years 
course, master course in London. It was called the Prince's School of Traditional Arts. Just 10, 10 persons from around the globe every year or something like that. We had uh, modules of uh, like one week, like really, really intense with one thing, you know, like stained glass. And we'd go through all the, uh, like lots of the, the techniques and how you do it. And, uh, and then you would produce also like artworks, you know, all the time. So we, you know, make our visual research, you know, document the, the, the process, how it's done. And like all the steps and procedures and gilding and uh, ceramic plates and lots of Islamic geometry, uh, Persian miniature painting and alchemy of paints, you know, how the different pigments relate. It's really fascinating. Dif different pigments symbolize different things. That it's not just about how the paint appears, but also the process of getting there that is a journey mm. and that it's a, also a, like an inward reflection uh, alchemy is not just uh, getting gold to become rich outwardly but it like transform your base character traits that are sort of like lead to become like golden <laughs> uh, I wanted to make a bow uh, when I was a little, like bow and arrow, and I carved something out of a, ju a juniper. And I also read some uh, uh, some um, archaeology papers, like extra, actually experimental archaeology. Somebody was making uh, sinew-backed bows. Like you'd use the sinew of an animal to strengthen the bow. And... Uh, he read about his observation. It was quite different back then. You you couldn't just watch a YouTube video seeing somebody do it, you know. <laughs> and I, I was twelve and I was planing and it worked fine for a while. <laughs> yeah, that was something that just came to me. Like I I was overwhelmed by, you know, I wanna, you know, make bows because it's such a it's very challenging. Like you have to really know the wood, you know, have to know how the wood would bend and uh, you know, it works with some kinds of wood, but it doesn't at all work with others. And uh, you have to really like communicate with the wood, you know, and sort of convince it <laughs> to be, become a bow. And um, and uh, if it's just a, a stick that you tiller, so it becomes thinner and thinner at the end, th that would be called a self bow. And uh, and it won't have to be very careful to, that it's that you don't sever the the grains, because then it would just break there. But you would um, you would watch and feel like the grain or or the growth rings. It depends on how you lay lay out the bow. But you really have to be you know careful and see, and you tiller it so you you put it on a like you put a, a string on the bow. And then you bend it a little bit and you see where is where is it bending and where is it not. And then where it's sort of stiff, you, you you remove a little bit and then you bend it again, you know, and then you keep on doing that for hours. So the whole bow is working. I mean, if you if you would have uh, the bow just bending or bending more at one spot, then it would uh, eventually break there. So you have to be, you know, evenly distributed. And... Uh, and also, if if it's sort of heavier at the tips of the bow, it would become very inefficient. So you want to transfer all the power that you're pulling, like you're pulling the string, you know, down, and the, all that power you want to transfer all of that to the arrow. And and if it's not, if it's sort of you know uh, the bow is heavier, thing you know it becomes <coughs> you know like that when you're shooting it. But then, uh, but if everything is perfectly balanced and also the the arrows you know the weight of the arrow even and the stiffness because if you have a if you have a very heavy bow you know like uh, take a lot of power to to pull it then you can't have a really weak uh, arrow because that would it would sort of push it so it would bend a lot what what was the recent interest in making bows because you've developed like quite an intensive 
seems to be an intensive passion for making bows. Um, it's um, because it's um, a sunnah. It's uh, it's in the lifestyle of the Prophet Sallallahu like to uh, uh, to shoot bow and arrow. You know, I I think that there's a lot of things about it that like it's so much more than just martial art. But if he recommended it, there is a lot more to it. It's strength, it's focus, it's like a meditation or a prayer. And there is something very focusing about it. That if you're firing an arrow, uh, you cannot be anywhere else. But you have to be in the moment, in your body. Uh, I think we're in desperate need of this kind of activities, and especially in our age, because everybody's so... Um, I don't know what to say, alienated, like you're just somewhere else. Your body's just a, in a different world. Like, like dhikr. Uh, dhikr is a remembrance, like remembering who you are, where you're going, remembering God. And uh, the opposite of that is ghafla, is heedlessness, which is a state that you know most of us are in. Sufis are talking about ecstasy of just being present you know you could even you know make a parallel to the art that we were speaking about that uh, um, for example why do we want to stylize it why do we want to make things flat you know like less dimensions for example and sort of like going back to the origin like back to the point of departure back to oneness you know if you have a one point you know with it Maybe if I showed you with a geometry that you put down the compass point and there's one point that you start with. So even, you know, with all of these geometric patterns, you know, the very elaborate it sort of points back to one origin, like Tawheed. So I'm, I by no means a uh, master boyer or a master archer. A lot of people are sort of, you know, rediscovering their heritage or sort of you know, like finding the balance that you could, you can be proud of where you're coming from and who you are and, and all of this, but also be inclusive to others. And I think this is a great gift that Islam can give people that you could, uh, be proud of, of your heritage um, with, without it turning into nationalism. Like, for example, I'm, yeah, I love this culture that, that I come from, but I can also appreciate Eritrean culture or West African or uh, Korean or uh, whatever, like what have you. So I think that that's very important. And... Uh, we're all here together, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, it's it's a few moments, and some sometimes you feel very connected to somebody who maybe look physically very different from you, but you you have a connection, like you feel that you understand each other. We're all alike, but yet we're all different. Everybody's unique. Yeah. Multiplicity and uh, uh, unity. That uh, that Islamic art uh, expresses. Unity, like I said, Tawheed, uh, but also multiplicity, that everything we see around us is multiplicity, right? If you walk uh, through a forest, you see a multiplicity of trees and they're all different, like every single tree is different, but yet they're all point back to this point of departure. So what we're seeing here are some stave churches and that's a Scandinavian wooden church built at the time of the transition between sort of paganism and Christianity. And, um, and it's very, very common with uh, sort of zoomorphic motifs on these. They're kind of animal like ornamentation and um, like we could see animals carved in and sometimes you can s it's something like um, 
that resembles uh, maybe a lion or a dog or something and it turns into a snake and then it just uh, goes around and into a weave and um, and it it's very fascinating because it's also um, uh, it's it, I said it, it's both similar to the Celtic style so it's all connected you know people were bor- borrowing ideas back and forth but it's also connected eastward and like to the like Turkic things and you know even further so uh so, so it's it's even connected like with the Mid- middle eastern styles that became the islami or the, the arabesque even which uh, if you open a, a quran if you open a mushaf today like lots of them have these ornaments um and uh, they just look like um just like geometric patterns mm-hmm. but they are really sort of distilled down stylized uh animals uh, or plants like and here if you look at the but lots of them are like very floral yeah uh a little crazy and <laughs> even dark and then i um compared and examined the different styles and also the you know older scandinavian things like um, that was before this and uh obviously like the tree structures from then di- didn't survive and a lot of these stave churches also burned down so that's why they started using stone instead because it lasts much longer uh but we have some jewelry for 5th 6th century sweden and they have the similar like you can see that it's the same style but so this is actually an animal you know we're looking at a little piece of uh, jewelry like a rectangle and it's a snake or a bird or something biting its own yeah. but it's so stylized that it just yeah. looks like a pattern you know repeating pattern and uh, it's funny to me that the older ornaments are much more controlled they're much more um sort of stylized whereas the you know later viking and after that they, they're sort of wild this to me is more sophisticated and i think it's not so much about getting a an illusion of an animal it's not about you know a three-dimensional dragon but it's more about capturing the essence of the dragon even today and you know, maybe we're going back towards you know symbols and hieroglyphs like when you, people are sending messages to each other they would use different fruits and different things yeah. to, to convey messages yeah so for example this uh, the the left part of the portal is much wider like when you look at it you know and it it, it follows the same sort of rhythm and pattern and but it's not geometrically controlled as a, like it would be a an architect who would do it or it would construct it with a mm-hmm. compass and ruler, but rather maybe the, the plank that they had was much wider on the, and they would just carve away. <laughs> and when I saw it, I, I got this feeling that I, yeah, I have to carve a mihrab like that. Uh, and it, and it took, like, I really saw it in front of me and then it took three years before it materialized it. In wood. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when people make mosques or prayer rooms, and they normally it's just copy paste, and mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times it's copy paste without sort of understanding what they're copying. Yeah. So they're cropping it in the wrong way, and they sort of, and it, it becomes just like a pastiche. It's just a like a joke. Um, it lacks authenticity maybe yeah Mm -hmm. and it's not sort of in line with uh, the geometry of the room or like and Mm. the the space that it's in so it's sort of a lot of times the some things are off with it yeah but if you look at these historical sites they tend to be like very deliberate with the with the patterns and if you look at al hamra you know the the grand plan of the mosque um have the same sort of uh, proportions as the 
the fine uh, patterns that are carved into the stone. So it sort of it's resonating the same thing on different levels. You're really linking up a lot of things. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I was looking at the the mimbar of Salahuddin Ayyubi in Jerusalem. And I think that was in the 12th, 13th century. And I was looking at the, the figures and they look very much like the, the, the Nordic figures. But they were sort of like very small and um, contained on to a, a border with also like lots of geometric designs. But when I, when I zoom them up, you know, in comparing them to the Norwegian state churches, I thought that, you know, it's very, very much alike, you know, and, and also finding the link between them, it, it, it's more or less the same tradition. So I felt it like, you know, looking at the, like the portals of the, the state churches and that it would fit very much. So, so it's a sort of like a blend between uh, those borders and the Norwegian and also the, the even older, the, the Swedish ones. And then also the scale of it, the having it cut out in wood, in sort of, yeah, in really wide planks. I use cherry wood. With the linseed oil, it becomes almost red. And uh, I drew it out like to, to getting the flow of it uh, and then I put it on the, on the light box and drew it again and again and again and like to get like really get the hang of it and then I transferred it to to the planks and um, and then I quite organically l let it you know continue to grow in the same rhythm you know up uh, over the uh, the arch and then cut out everything, you know, by chisel and uh, mallet. Like really took its toll on my back. <laughs> yeah, so the whole thing, you know, with um, a place for it that you should go to in, uh, in a mosque in the south of Sweden. Uh, so that's why I also chose that because it would fit in nicely. And also I was looking at the uh, the architecture of the area, like uh, the, the church is there now, that they have a quite nice arch, that it's not it's not like a Roman arch, it, like, that would be totally rounded, that would go up and then down again. And also not like a Gothic arch, that would be very pointed. A point like that it points upward, right? But it, it becomes like... Very, for me, it's a too big emphasis on the on the vertical, but but rather if it's like kind of rounded, but a little bit pointed, like I, I sort of found. And then I did it also. I drew it not arbitrarily, but with uh, with geometry, using like the six days of creation and this pattern. You know, the, quite simple. So a mihrab is uh, like the niche or the the piece. Uh, in the front of the mosque where the imam stands and the, where the imam uh, where he prays it's not towards the congregation but um, he's like leading the way forward and everybody's standing in the same direction so the mihrab is sort of you know focusing everyone and it focus your attention and I had the, the ornaments of it around the, the niche but the niche itself is just white uh, so that you you're sort of aware of the these symbols around you, but it is not distracting you. It's not getting your gaze to turn away here and there. And this is something that I also experienced myself when walking into a mosque, like for example, like the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, like where you have l lots of things happening above you. Like there's a lot of calligraphy in the ceiling and uh, lots of these arabesques and things, but in where your eyes rest in prayer, it's very sober and clean. So it's like you're feeling the angelic realm, you're like you're feeling everything goes on, but you're still focusing on Allah. Like you feel, you, it doesn't, you don't waver. And I think the traditional craftspeople of old times were much more aware of these things than a lot of us are today. Like, uh, I think there was a very different mindset uh, but a lot of traditional craftsmen, they wouldn't 
I mean, they would even be anonymous, like nobody knew who, who they were. And in the big mosque of Cordoba, you have the all the signatures of the the crafts people who who did it, and some some wrote their names, but lots of them just wrote Lilla, just to God, like it, it's not for my sake, it's for, for, for God's sake. So uh, this is the this very uh, stark opposition to uh, what's going on nowadays. We just want to promote ourselves, especially like being a being being an artist or a craftsman. Like you, you have to sell yourself all the time, you know. And if people don't value your work, you have to sort of convince them to value. Which is it's very strange to navigate, you know, these things. Yeah, it's contra- very contradictory. Isn't yeah, it? it's not just about intention. It's not like just that oh I want to make something beautiful and then you just accept everything but it's lots of skill you know the work that this is this means this this affect people like this and if you have a flat roof it's not the same as a dome for example you can look at it as uh, like the Ottomans they took the the Orthodox Church as their model of making a mosque uh, like you have the the dome which is like uh, the celestial realm you know like the heaven having the sphere uh, uh, b- because that's how it feels like when you're inside it like it's you know it's vast it's very grand and it's like the horizon like wherever you look you know it's like a circle it's it's both the, the scale and the the art behind it but it's also the secrets it's like the like you say intentions and the Maybe the prayers that they did when they did it, so you're getting inspiration while they while you do it. If you actually grab a, a compass and, and a pen and you draw it, you know there's a connection between your your mind, your heart, and your arm. So you're getting involved in it with your whole being in another sense. And then, like a lot of a lot of times when people do this, they sort of get inspired to do it, like by the golden mean ratio and things like that and if you analyze it afterwards so you have this you have it in you sort of in, intuitively i think so i think it's mm. very important to sort of be in, to be involved with the process in, on different levels and i heard that in in yemen when they were building houses they, they would use they would read sort of yasin for every block they would put in so that i guess there's a lot of things that we don't see also that maybe we feel you know, somehow that we feel the presence. I did study uh, calligraphy with a master in Damascus, Ustad uh, Yusuf Bukhari. The, the letters of writing have different uh, rules and proportions that uh, there is a relationship with the width and the, and the length of, of the letters and the spacing and everything. And you do it by dipping the pen, the pen in, in ink and put it down so you to make dots that you compare you like the uh, the letters. So there are different scripts in Arabic, and uh, but one of the scripts that are not so much used to writing but more like a architectural feature or a design is the Kufic script. It refers to uh, Kufa, uh, the town in Iraq, it's a very prominent in like, early Islamic history. In particular, one type of Kufic, which is a squared Kufic, where the, where it's so stylized that it fits into a grid. And there are also uh, Chinese s- stamps and designs that are made in sort of this, the same way. So maybe it was uh, borrowed from each other. So it's Arabic script that uh, that fits into a grid. So it's not, to me, it's much more simple than, for example, the Thuluth script or the Diwani or the Nestalik. That are sort of, you know, fluid and it really records something of the time, like when you're writing it. Like if you so you go back to it, you can see it. it's like you could play up the recording when he was writing it. Like you see how the ink was flowing and everything. So it's... So it's something that is really hard to perfect. 
but then with to me the the square kufic script it's it's different in a, in other way it's like you can play with it you know and play see how you can bend the the letters around you know to make it into uh into a square or into a shape and and then you know to see if it's still sort of readable you know that you can you can change the letters and you see that you still see that this is a scene this is not a something else that it's, and uh i work with that sometimes and do this sort of you know spiral uh, compositions so that it's a, it's like a whole you know more or less like w- words that that fits together so it's like a puzzle to get it all together and recently i did a design of uh, the ahlul kisa the, the people of the cloak that there is a tradition the way the the prophet put the cloak around his immediate family ali and fatima and hasan and hussein alayhi salam radiyallahu anhu so so this allah in the middle and then muhammad muhammad muhammad, muhammad ali 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 and then so it fits uh, together all of it and i gilded it with the uh, gold leaf and that's also something that i learned in london uh, to use uh, used garlic juice you know <laughs> squeeze a garlic and then you paint on where where it's supposed to be gold and you let it dry and then you breathe on it you know like this and the moisture of the air activates like the stickiness of the garlic and you put to put the gold on and it sticks it could be there for a thousand years <laughs> like you know like the lindis farm books or or some amluk quran if you see it like nothing happens to the gold it doesn't oxidize or anything it's not the garlic the the garlic is is just i mean there are different mordants you could use egg white or you could have um, what else gum arabic there, there are different recipes so and i think to become a gilder is is very very hard thing There's lots of things that can can go wrong it's very delicate and i think the the sheets of gold are like 400 atoms thick or something <laughs> so even though gold is very heavy if you have a liter of gold it weighs i think 20 kilos but then you know the gold you just put it on in your hand and rub it and then just gone bismillah <laughs> rahman rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa afdalus salatu wa tamma taslim ala sayidina muhammad khatim al anbiya wa imam al mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam